joining Alianza Nacional de Campesinas, the Child Labor Coalition, and National Farm Worker Ministry for this webinar about child labor and agriculture, and how you can help make a difference for farm workers and their families. Tonight's webinar will be can be heard in English and Spanish, and I'm going to let Henry, our translator, give you the directions on that. Hi, everyone. Good evening. So thank you for joining us tonight. Um, there will be simultaneous interpretation. So that means that you will need to choose a channel depending on the language that you prefer. If you uh, prefer English, uh, please go down to the um, icon, the little globe icon at the bottom of your screen and select English because maybe somebody who speaks Spanish will be commenting or putting on a question. Um, in Spanish, so then you'll be able to hear the English translation. So you can go ahead and do that after I finish the instructions. Uh, para todos que están aquí hoy en la noche, pues muchas gracias por venir y vamos a tener interpretación simultánea en español. La presentación va a ser en inglés, entonces va a ser interpretada al español y yo voy a interpretarles. En un momento vamos a aprender la interpretación y va a haber un globo, un icono de globo abajo de su pantalla y va a poder escoger el idioma. Eh, escoja español si necesita escuchar esto en español cuando vamos a aprender eh, esta aplicación y ahora vamos a comenzar. So, Megan, could you please turn on the interpretation? Thank you so much, Henry. I'm Rose, the Director of Communications with National Farm Worker Ministry, and I'm excited to introduce tonight's speakers. At the end of the presentation, we will have time for questions and answers. However, we encourage you to go ahead and put your questions in the chat box as they arise, and I'll go ahead and um, get those copied out so we can answer them during the Q&A portion. Tonight's speakers, we have Mili Trevino Sosara, is the executive director of Alianza Nacional de Campesinas, which is the first national women farm workers organization in the US created by current and former women farm workers, along with women who hail from farm worker families. Millie directs Alianza as they work to unify the struggle to promote women farm workers leadership and a national movement to create broader visibility and advocate for change that ensure their human rights. Reed Mackey is the coordinator of the Child Labor Coalition, which serves as a national network for the exchange of information about child labor, provides a unified voice on protecting working minors and creates educational outreach to public and private sectors. Reed coordinates the activities of the Child Labor Coalition striving to minimize abusive child labor and to protect the health, safety, and well-being of child workers in the United States and abroad. Julie Taylor is the Executive Director of the National Farm Worker Ministry, which is a faith-based organization committed to social, economic, and racial justice for farm workers. Julie directs NFWM as they educate, equip, and mobilize member organizations, and other faith communities, groups, and individuals to support farm worker-led efforts to improve their living and working conditions. Thank you again for joining us. Just a reminder, please drop your questions in the chat box, and we will do our best to answer them during the Q&A portion of the presentation. Good evening, everyone. We're happy that you've joined us tonight to talk about this important issue, child labor in agriculture. When we talk about child labor hey. in U.S. agriculture, we're, I'm sorry. When we talk about child labor in U.S. Agri agriculture, we're wondering how many, how many children are we talking about? about? Justice for Migrant Women reports that there are between 300 and 500,000 child farm workers in the U.S. These numbers are not generally included in the numbers recorded by the Department of Labor. Many children are paid in cash 
or their hours or their piece rate wages are included in their parents' paycheck. The federal minimum age to work in agriculture is just 12 years old. If children are working in the fields, what does that mean in regard to their legal protections? 25 states do not have any limits on the amount of hours a child farm worker can work. 35 states allow children under 16 to work seven days a week in agriculture. And 25 states do not have any restrictions of children working at night in ag agriculture. Farm workers sometimes work late into the night or begin in the wee hours of the morning, both to avoid extreme heat and at the height of the harvest season. Child farm workers are at risk doing this kind of work specifically because agriculture is the most dangerous sector U.S. children are allowed to work in. The fatality rate is four times higher than any other sector. 33 children are injured on farms every day, and a child dies in a farm-related accident once every three days in the United States. Children's bodies and brains are still developing, so they are particularly vulnerable to the harmful effects of pesticide, heat-related illnesses, violent co contact with animals or other humans, the youth, use of sharp tools, heavy machinery, and dangerous transportation vehicles. The risk of pesticide exposure is extremely high for child farm workers. A Wake Forest study of medicine survey uh, surveyed child farm workers in North Carolina and found that only 8% of the participants in the survey received any pesticide training, even though it is required by North Carolina law that all farm workers receive training within a week of beginning their work. According to experts, children are three times more vulnerable to pesticides than adults are. Even if youth are not directly handling pesticides, they are still exposed when planting, weeding, thinning, pruning, harvesting, and processing crops that have been sprayed. Immigration status adds to the stressful realities of farm worker families. Farm workers are often scared to utilize programs or sometimes even leave their homes due to fear of deportation. This persistent fear for themselves or family members can weigh heavy on farm worker youth. The lack of oversight and penalties due to the isolated nature of the work environment exacerbates the number of criminal acts committed against child and adult farm workers. The immigration status of a child, parent, or the whole family frequently makes farm workers more susceptible to exploitation. Some supervisors threaten to report undocumented youth or their family members if workers don't comply to all their demands. What impact does child labor have on farm worker children's education? Migrant students have one of the highest dropout rates in the United States. Many of the children who migrate with their families for farm work will change schools two to three times a year. For children in the migrant chain, they may lose the last month of school in order to begin their work and then will return a month or two late in the fall when the harvest season is over. Many migrant students find it find it challenging to make friends or join extracurricular activities when they're enrolled in one school, when they're not enrolled in one school for a full year. However, when farm worker students are given proper support, they are able to succeed in school. At the core, we need to understand that farm worker families feel forced to have their children work. Because of their own financial burden, 25% of all farm workers have a family 
income below the poverty line. When parents make poverty wages, they need their children to work too so they can pay necessary expenses. Because of language bar barriers, many farm workers need their children in the fields with them to help translate instructions from field managers. Because of a lack of childcare, there's a tangible lack of affordable child care and sometimes no child care at all. And our speakers may mention others. At this point, I want to invite Millie to share about the impact of child labor on farm worker families. Thank you, Julie. Thank you for inviting um, Alianza to be part of this webinar and uh, to share so that I could share experiences about what child labor has cost uh, in many farm worker families. And we all know that because um, uh, there, there still is um, lack of protections in most states, as you were saying, um, there's a word that people might already know that uh, agricultural um, workers are not part of the Fair Labor Standards Act, much less part of the industrial relations. There's no protections in most of the states. And um, so it's much easier for companies to hire children at a very early age and pay uh, wages that are that keep families in poverty. And um, as we know, there's a lot of wage theft and wage theft meaning that, uh, how companies promise a certain amount and then end up uh, paying much less uh, for it. That happened to my family, that happened to many families uh, during the time uh, we worked in the fields in the 70s, 80s, and um, we still see that. And um, a, a lot more things uh, that um, Julie was talking about that are where we know that um, uh, the different kind of accidents that happen are in its majority of the time not reported because many companies um, uh, hire children knowing that um, they're they're putting children at risk, uh, not giving them any any kind whatsoever, um, uh, you know, jobs that are less risk risky, and uh, they they treat children like if they were adults, and at the same time. Um, Many families uh, bring their children because of what um, uh, uh, Julie was talking about, but at the same time, because um, all the weight theft that usually happens, and uh, as I said, uh, the wages are way below, many more times, way below minimum wage. And um, uh, at at this uh, at the same time, I do want to share that. Um, in California, even though California is the only state that has full protections for farm workers, um, it still has that children have to, are allowed to work, quote unquote, if they're part of, uh, if they're working next to their family. Um, at the same time, uh, it's, um, it's, a, it's a big issue because uh, the, the agencies that are supposed to be protecting or monitoring are, you know, have very little resources and are not there to be uh, inspecting and making sure that companies are following uh, rules and regulations. We already have very, it's very easy to, to know that children are not being protected because um, we find many companies that are already um, doing um, a lot of bad, con you know, working conditions um, with adults. So um, it's it's very easy for for children to be ignored. So 
many more times uh, families are uh, are pressured to as as we're saying are to bring their their children to work and um the majority of the time children say or the parents say that they're much older than than the age that they have we have found children that at the age of nine eight working in the fields and the the crew leader is saying that that, that child is 14 years old um, we know that some children might look uh, you know as a teenager but they are much younger uh, as as I was saying, our family our our family went through many many issues, uh, and I can I can attest to that because I saw how my my brothers um, were got injured on the job, and uh, to the point that um, one of them had to end up in the hospital, and the com the the company owner. Uh, told my dad he could not say that my brother was working in the fields because he nearly cut all his fingers uh, while moving irrigation pipes and trying to connect it to another pipe. And um, and uh, I remember my brother was only nine years old, and um, he my brother did not you know he was in shock. At the same time, we were all watching how you know all the blood and the whole thing at the same time not knowing what to do um but my parents were able to to uh, help us understand that uh, we were trying to at least help the family and i think that children um in our communities try to help out because we see the poverty, we see how important it is for our families uh, to be able to survive. Because we see we see the lack of food in the refrigerator. We get to see um, how we have to move place to place, and there's more there's more expenses when you you have to migrate from one place to another, and by the time you're you're trying to get another job, you have very few dollars in your pocket to be able to stay in the family. And um, at the same time, um, children miss from going to work, um, miss all the important parts of being a child. So I, it's very important for us to keep pushing for uh, protection for workers because uh, we we don't want to see more fatalities. Um, we knew when we were children uh, conversations with our parents and other parents that came from other states where um, there had been fatalities and uh, it wasn't just adults. It was um, also um, children uh, at a very early age. There's no need for that. Uh, what we need is to make sure that farm workers um, have a better uh, protecting um, environment and at the same time that their wages are increased um, similar to other other uh, wages in, in other kind of industries. And uh, we, we know that we're not part of the Labor Standards Act. And uh, this is a very... This country has a government that continues being very racist. And I, I will always say this because um, ever since the 30s, when uh, the Labor Standards Act was passed, um, the only reason why uh, it had Congress pass it was that uh, there was a negotiation where agricultural workers would not be included. Why? Because many of these many of these Congress people, and I think there there's still many of them here, you know, in terms of generations, were uh, either sponsored by plantation owners uh, that used to have slaves and how dare, or were also, uh, you know, were plantation, plantation owners themselves that how dare they were gonna give uh, protections to who was 
was in their past a slave to to their family and um but we see that this is um this continues being uh uh a kind of industry that enslaves people to continue in poverty to continue uh having to make decisions like this in terms of bringing their children to to work to to help sustain the family and to uh you know put put children and the family at risk not only with accidents but in terms of reasonings and many other things that are said so um uh, we urge uh, that uh, there's, you know, to help us protect um, our, our, our agricultural community by, by supporting when we're pushing for uh, better regulations. I'll stop here because uh, there are some uh, uh, other, other people like Reed that's going to, it has uh, good information for us. And um, I will uh, more than gladly answer questions or um julie can can also um if i'm allowed to talk again <laughs> right now I'll be, I'll be more than willing to do that you will be um so i mean information like this and the realities like this uh can often feel overwhelming and so we want to focus on things that can be done about this and there are actions that you can take there's legislation that you can support so i want to invite um, read to, to talk about some of that and the work of the Child Labor Coalition. So, Reed? Oh, yeah. Thanks, Julie. And thanks, Millie. Um, I agreed with all both of your comments. Um, and, you know, as a matter of fact, you know, the racist roots of, of some of these inequities, um, going back to the Fair Labor Standards Act, the UN um, Committee on the uh, to End Racial Discrimination just came out with recommendations that that the child labor loopholes be closed and they you know they basically said that yes these are racist you know they they discriminate against migrant kids who are often latino uh, or latina so um and i you know millie's comments also reminded me that as we work to improve protections for child farm workers we desperately need to increase wages for adult farm workers um, because, you know, it's, it is poverty, as Millie said, it's poverty that's compelling them to bring their kids to the fields. And, and so, you know, if we don't raise wages for adults, um, you know, that, that poverty will continue. So, um, yeah, I want to talk about some solutions. You know, the, the coalition's been around for about three decades, has 37 great organizational members, some, um, you know, some, some big groups you've heard of, like the National Education Association, the biggest teacher union in the country, the American Federation of Teachers, Human Rights Watch. It's got a lot of farm worker groups like Farm Worker Justice and AFOP and um, Justice for Migrant Women. Um, you know, we welcome more members if anybody, if any groups are out there and want to join, um, talk to me. Um, but I, yeah, I want to talk about, I've only got, um, forgot to hit start on my timer, Julie, so you have to keep me on, on track here. I've just hit hit it. Uh, I, I thought I'd just show you a few photos of kids that I've seen doing field investigations. This first one wasn't one that I met, but um, it was a photo taken by Robin, Robin Romano, who was a great photographer of child farm workers. And uh, this, um, I'm sorry, let's see, the next one uh, was Yesenia, the 12 year old. Um, she was one of three generations of farm worker farm workers in the field I met in Texas, working with her parents and her grandparents and her cousin. Um, this next little girl, Mariella, was 10, and she was quite ill the day I met her. I think she was having an allergic reaction to the onions. Um, and you can see these giant scissors the kids use to cut onions, to trim onions, and um, they're razor sharp. And um, you know, our, our colleague Norma Flores Lopez um, said that when she would work in the fields, like during spring break, um, her hands, she'd go back to school, her hands were so sore that she couldn't hold a pencil. Um, so um, um, there's a couple more that I can quickly show you, but um, um, there's, there's the next boy, it was Yesenia's cousin, uh, Sergio, he was only 10. And um, 
you know, there are loopholes on top of loopholes. So there's the big exemption in the Fair Labor Standards Act that exempted agriculture, but there's a small farm exemption. So, um, you know, what does Sergio know about the size of the farm? You know, he's protected on a big farm, but if, if he goes to work on a little farm, then it's legal. So it, it really doesn't make sense uh, at all, all these loopholes. And why, why, uh, why allow kids to work in agriculture, which is so dangerous? You know, we have the data. Uh, a kid dies on a farm every three days. 33 are injured every day. It just doesn't make sense to um, have this big exemption for agriculture. So um, I think there's a couple more photos I'd like to show. Um, uh, that's that's the, this boy's trimming onions. Um, Christina was only nine, working with a pretty large family. As, as Millie said, they make less than minimum wage, often sometimes only a dollar or two dollars an hour when you're when you're her age. And you know she wasn't the most effective worker, uh, but she was trying her hardest. And um, anyways, I should probably uh, you uh, you can keep going with the photos. There's only a few more. Um, I want to tell you about a solution, and our solution is legislation that would close the gap in the Fair Labor Standards Act. And um, we're not asking for any special treatment for farm worker kids. We're just asking for them to be treated like every other kid in every other sector. You know, kids who work in retail or restaurants, um, just to be treated the same. It absolutely, absolutely makes no sense that I can't hire my nephew to come in and work in an air-conditioned office for, um, you know, who's, if he's 12, he can't come in this air-conditioned office and work, um, uh, you know, in relative comfort but I can send that same child into a field and ask them to work unlimited hours. The law allows them to work unlimited hours in the field um, as long as they're not missing school. So it, it, it's absolutely crazy. Um, so the, the solution is the Children's Act for Responsible Employment and Farm Safety. It's HR 7345. And I'll put a link in the chat in a, in a few minutes here. Um, that will allow you to, um, you know, to talk to your congressman about this act. But basically, it raises the age of child work from 12 to 14 um, and uh, creates a little bit of discretion on the Department of Labor for like tasks that are, you know, that are more difficult. And, um, you know, the other thing is um, the current age for hazardous work in agriculture is only 16. For every other sector, it's 18. So if, you're, if you drive a forklift at, at uh, Walmart, you have to be 18. If you drive a forklift in an agricultural processing shed, you can be 60. It makes no sense. They're the same machine. They're, they're both dangerous. They both tip over. They both hurt and kill kids, uh, teenagers. So um, the CARE Act would raise the, those two really important minimum ages. It would increase fines for child labor. It would collect data. Um, it would, um, it, you know, it basically would just level the playing field. And, um, and it doesn't, um, you know, it would not apply to kids working on their parents' farm, a farm owned by their parents, because uh, we know, you know, those kids might inherit the farm. They probably do need to learn a lot of farm tasks. Um, and um, the, the bill currently has 45 co-sponsors in the Congress, which is not a bad number, but it's not the number we need to get it to move. It recently had a hearing and the hearing went well. Um, you know, help get some attention on the bill. We also had a press conference. Um, and, um, and we have had, as we've had over a hundred co-sponsors in prior Congresses. So, um, you know, the bill has some appeal. Uh, unfortunately, we haven't had much luck getting it to be bipartisan. Um, we haven't had much luck getting Republicans to support child labor um, legislation. Um, we hope that'll change someday. Um, I, you know, I think both sides of the aisle can, can understand that, that children working unlimited hours at 12 is not a good thing, especially doing something dangerous. So um, hopefully we'll do better in the future on that point. Uh, a second bill I wanted to talk about is the Children Don't Belong in Tobacco Farms Act. And that is legislation that's specific to um, uh, child labor and tobacco. Um, this came about in 2014, Human Rights Watch did um, some original research they talked to, um, I think it was over 150 kids, and they found that most of those kids had suffered symptoms that correlated with green tobacco sickness, which is basically nicotine poisoning. You know, they had dizziness and fainting, and some kids vomited, some kids passed out, um, and they just felt really sick. I, I heard one little girl describe it as feeling like she was going to die. 
Um, so like the flu on steroids, basically. Um, and, um, you know, in, in the U.S., um, I don't know if you, a, a lot of people don't know this, but they changed the law a couple of years ago. So you, ha you have to be 21 to buy cigarettes in the U.S. now. Uh, used to be 18. And um, but we'll take it. We'll take a 12 year old and we'll let them work on a tobacco farm, um, you know, which makes absolutely no sense. Uh, in those photos you saw a few moments ago, there was a girl working with a black plastic garbage bag around her. And that's common you know, on tobacco fields. Um, tobacco workers are so desperate not to get contaminated by nicotine that they'll wear a plastic bag. And, you know, the, the big tobacco states are hot. They're, you know, North Carolina, they're Virginia, Kentucky, Tennessee, they are hot. And you can, can, you can imagine working like in, you know, in July or August in a hundred in 95 degree temperatures, wearing a black plastic garbage bag and several layers of clothes, just desperately trying to keep this toxic poison from your skin. Um, you know, nicotine can kill. It's really toxic. So, um, so yeah, so that bill, uh, the bill is um, uh, children don't belong in tobacco farms, HR 3865. There's, this one has a Senate version, unlike the CARE Act. Um, we've been working for a, a Senate version of the CARE Act, but we haven't been able to find somebody to introduce that yet. Um, the Senate version is S2044. And um, it's got about, uh, the House version has about 30 co-sponsors. The Senate version has three. We're working with Human Rights Watch and Justice for Migrant Women and other groups to try to get those numbers up. Um, the last thing I want to talk about, and I'm just about out of time here, uh, is our effort to, to reopen um, safety regulations for farms called the Hazardous Occupation Orders. And these, um, DOL tried to update these in 2010, but the organized farm lobby um, came out with a giant campaign. We thought it was a misinformation campaign. Um, said that the that these rules would kill the family farm, um, even though the um, you know like the Care Act, it would, the children of the farmers would be exempted from from the rules on their family farm. Um, we we you know they kind of trivialized the the rules, which were common sense protections about like things like working on ladders. They you know they said that kids shouldn't work more than six feet high because current, current rules allow kids to work at 20 feet high. And um, they said, which is crazy, right? I mean, uh, you know, imagine a 12 year old in a 20 foot ladder picking cherries, that's dangerous. Um, so um, um, yeah, they said things like um, that if the rules passed, kids couldn't use flashlights on farms because flashlights were considered power driven equipment. And they said kids couldn't use water hoses on farms um, because some water hoses are pressurized. And, um, anyways, they, the farm lobby was very effective and was able to defeat these common sense protections. And um, so we, you know, it's 10, flash forward 10 years, and there have been no new protections for the kids. And it doesn't make sense. You know, we have a lot more data. We, we you know, we know that um, we have a lot more history of kids dying. We have, we have a list of 50 tragic farm deaths that have occurred in the last 20 years. Um, but, you know, that number is much, much higher. So um, we've had these meetings with DOL, Wage and Hour, and, uh, and some other folks at DOL to reopen these regs. And they, they are, um, there's hint, some hints that they might, may do something in the spring. Um, it may be narrowly focused, maybe narrowly focused on like, you know, one or two protections. But um, we really want this process to get, to restart. Um, so. That's, um, you know, so basically we're giving you kind of three solutions here. Um, and then the overarching solution is better wages for farm workers. You know, they need, they need overtime, they need vacation time, they need, they need benefits um, uh, so they don't feel compelled to bring their kids to the field. So I'm gonna stop there. I, I'm afraid I went over, a little bit over, but um, uh, and happy to answer questions down the road here. All right, thanks. Thanks, Reed. I appreciate you doing that. Uh, and I wanna, uh, want us to look at some a, a few other pieces of legislation that we can, uh, we, we, you talked about the CARE Act and uh, we are working on that. That's a big push for us during the 
harvest of justice season as we focus on child labor. A few more pieces of legislation, and I want Millie to specifically speak to the ban of organophosphates, but just to briefly say that um, we have been supporting the Asuncion Valdivia Heat Illness and Fatality Protection Act um, so that there will be national regulations through the through OSHA, the Occupation uh, Safety and Health Administration, um, for the whole country uh, to prevent uh, specifically fatalities, but also heat, heat illnesses. It's named after a farm worker, Asuncion Valdivia, who, who died because of complications of, of heat stress in California. Um, California has regulations for this. Washington State and Oregon both um, enacted emergency regulations during the, you know, some of the severe heat that they have had. Um, but we believe that there should be uh, national heat stress regulations to protect farm workers and especially uh, children. There's a very comprehensive piece of legis legislation called Protect America's Children from to Toxic Pesticides Act. It touches on so many different things. Um, and it's been sort of languishing in Congress. Several of our farm worker partners, farm worker association especially, have been promoting this particular uh, this particular bill. Um, a, a smaller version, a more narrow version that has, uh, we think, a little more traction right now is the Ban Organophosphates Act. So organophosphates are in the to toxic pesticides, but they're pulled out sort of uniquely. And um, uh, Millie's group, Alianza, has been working very closely with Earth Justice on this. Uh, on this, Do you want to speak to that, Millie? Earth? Yes, thank you, Julie. Um, yes, uh, the, the number for the act is uh, HR 8765. And this act uh, is actually named uh, or titled as ban of no neurotoxic organophosphate pesticides from our food act. And it was introduced um, at the end um, of August and uh, by Congresswoman uh, um, uh, Velasquez uh, and uh, along other uh, co-sponsor uh, you know, uh, House of Representatives. Uh, it was introduced in the House of Representatives as, and actually it was referred uh, and it was, which was referred to the Committee on Energy and Commerce. And uh, this, this legislation is about making sure that um, the Organophosphates, it's a, it's a variety, a long list of, of different kind of pesticides that are used in, in uh, uh, fruits and vegetables and uh, that we know have caused all sorts of, of different uh, problems in, in, um, in, in as if women are working uh, and they're pregnant, uh, their fetus uh, does not develop the same way if they're exposed to these kind of chemicals at the same time. Uh, we have seen how children have been born, born with special needs and um, certain uh, abnormalities. And it has to do with uh, the kind of uh, uh, um, uh, toxics or, or pesticides and they're part of the family of or, or organophosphates. I'm so used to saying it in Spanish, organophosphorados. <laughs> and um, we know that um, the this is uh, a very, it, it, it will be a, a legislation that's gonna take a long haul because there's there's there, there are several Congress people that need to be educated on, on uh, you know what how much harm is not, is causing not only workers but adjacent communities that are right there uh, next to the fields when all these toxics are, or pesticides are being sprayed 
at the same time, um, uh, how, how bad it is that we don't even have much information about how, uh, how much of these toxics are kept or still part of uh, or, or stay in the fruit or the vegetables. At, at the same time, uh, we have been working with this and, and thank you with uh, uh, the National Farm Worker uh, Ministry that has um, been supporting us. Um, a rural coalition has also been involved in several other of our groups have been involved uh, like Líderes Campesinas and we want to make sure we get more um, um, representatives, not only House of Representatives, but uh, senators um, from Congress, because it's so important that we get uh, the support and uh, make sure that um, not only that Congress people are educated, but the public is uh, educated about what it is going on in the field and in communities where there's a lot of agriculture. And so uh, we are get, uh, doing um, uh, site visits in this majority through Zoom <laughs> for the same reason. Um, it's, um, but we are convincing and we are building that consciousness with uh, not only the staffers, but also with uh, the Congress people. Uh, we have been trying to see, we can also talk or we have had already conversations with um, uh, some some senator senators and especially um, uh, uh, senators from that are the two senators that are in California. Uh, we we need to make sure that we we get their their support because it's it's so important for us. Um, this this is um, this is actually. Uh, uh, legislation that will support for many chemicals uh, not being used. Uh, organophosphates has created some, you know, the chemical companies have created uh, many different kinds of brands um, that have this this kind of chemicals, and apparently they're 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 used to uh, kill funga fungicide and kill um, herbicides and kill uh, in, insecticides and rodenticides. And, uh, but the problem is it's also killing and damaging um, our, you know, our, our, our worker and their families. So um, this, is, this is so important for us that we keep uh, uh, mobilizing and building consciousness with, with uh, Congress people. Thanks, Millie. So I want to mention just a couple more really briefly. Um, child labor happens in, the, happens in the context of the overall family. And so um, I think we've already said this before, but, but National Farm Worker Ministry for a long time has supported efforts around the Fairness for Farm Workers Act, which is otherwise called the overtime bill, um, because overtime pay for farm workers would reduce the financial burden for families overall. If you pay the parents a livable wage, they won't need to have their children work. Um, we are also supporting uh, the migrant education program. Uh, so states and localities have access to funds to support migrant education. Um, so we need to urge them to take advantage of these funds to be sure that these funds are allocated to the states and localities and then use them um, for migrant education where they are. Um, and there's more information about each of these uh, in our resources on child labor this year. But I wanted to try to get, if we can, a few questions um, before, uh, but before our time slips away from, the, from us. So Rose, if you'll come back on maybe and ask us some, some of the questions that folks have put in the chat. Sure. So um, I'll get the one of them because I think I can answer it pretty quickly. One, uh, uh, somebody asked about the children in the pictures that Reed shared. And Reed, you can correct me if I'm wrong. But the uh, pictures that were on the onion farms or in Texas, the 
pictures on tobacco farms were in North Carolina. And then there was also, I don't remember the type of farm, but it was in Washington. So uh, a variety of places uh, in which those pictures take place. That's correct. Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, some of the, I, I was just going to say, Rose, some of the pictures in our part of the presentation are from California, Washington State, Oregon, uh, North Carolina, and Florida. So, yeah. Uh, first question, uh, or second, I guess. In Ghana, West Africa, one in eight children working in the cocoa industry are enslaved workers. Do we have any information about children working in the U.S. in agriculture against their will? Um, yeah, I, we don't really have a very good handle of that. It, I mean, it seems that most of the kids, at least the ones I've met, have, um, you know, they're working with their families, uh, immediate families often. And, you know, they're doing it willingly, but, you know, can you, do they really have a choice if poverty compels them to work? And their parents don't make enough money to feed the family. So, um, you know, it depends how you look at it. You could consider that to be a form of slavery. Um, but um, um, we, I don't see a lot of evidence that children are being forced to work. Now, there are unaccompanied minors, you know, in the recent years that have come over the border. And we don't have a good handle on what's happening with those kids. Now, maybe maybe Millie has a better sense since, um, you know, she has some um, she, she's closer to the field than I am. Um, but, um, um, you know, I haven't, I haven't heard too many cases of, of um, forced labor. Millie, have you? The, the problem here is, as we are saying, um, uh, there were some interviews that were done that I got involved in um, around 2010, 2011. And I was able to go to different states and I'm, I'm sharing this because how interesting it was when um, uh, the interviews were all, all with women and it had to do with um, uh, the uh, sexual abuse and also as they crossed the border, um, if they also encountered that kind of issue. And uh, of course, um, the majority of the women that I interviewed, there were uh, around 100 um, shared that that was a, a big, big issue. That was a very pervasive issue, uh, a very um, a problem. And uh, at the same time in Florida, especially in Florida and uh, New York State, because those were two of the, of the five or six different states that I went to, um, uh, uh, the women, what we found is that, uh, and I'm sharing this because uh, women have, uh, when I was interviewing them, shared that they had been working, you know, as as early as you know, as teenagers, and um, they, when they would share that they they were um, they they were uh, at an age of like 24, 25, they looked much older because of the kind of work they were doing, and at the same time. They they said that they 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 shared that they had already been working ten or or twelve years. What does that mean? How old were they? At the same time, uh, they they did share that their their um, uh, when they worked on a piece rate level, which is not an hourly um, rate, um, uh, many more times in order for them to have a job would go with uh, either their, their significant other or their spouse uh, to work, and, but only one social security was, uh, number was used. And that means it was, it was the man uh, using the social security. So she was invisible. And um, as, as they shared that they were working in the fields for 10, 12 years, or even 14 years, um, uh, they said that um, the majority of the time that they have worked in the fields, they've been married or they've been living with someone. Um, and um, and uh, we didn't go as far in terms of the interviews as far as finding out if they had been trafficked or or they was there any you know kind of like um, issue like that. But uh, it was it was as far as how how invisible 
things are. Um, if farm workers are generalized in, in, in society and, uh, and being essential, but not, I mean, not being visible, uh, much less the issues that are happening, uh, uh, society doesn't know. So if, if children are working, as we said, if children are working and um, um, uh, there's, there's been times that we have found uh, women that um, were at a, started at, at a, here in California, they had started working at an age of 11. They, they quote unquote, were already um, working with uh, what they would call their spouse. Um, and uh, it, interesting, um, no one talked about uh, tra being trafficked, but the way they shared the information, um, it, a lot of it was, uh, you know, being forced to live in situations or to live with people and to work along people uh, just to be able to survive in this country or that were promised that they were gonna have a better, uh, better life in the United States as they were brought in. And many more times these, these women or children were, were brought in with the um, intention of, of, of making them feel that, you know, everything was gonna be good for them, everything, you know, they were gonna have a better situation and uh, because they did not come with their parents, they came with someone else. Um, of course, when we say trafficking, it's about you know not only enslaving someone, but it's um, it's um, uh, using them for so they can be earning uh, money uh, for them. Uh, but uh, we have found uh, it's very it's much harder to find these kind of um, situations, this kind of uh, uh, problems that do exist, um, but it's, uh, people are much more afraid to share. Even, even people that know that things are not right, uh, uh, what they see, if anything is happening, um, uh, just because it, it, everything has to do that everybody quote unquote knows each other and they're blacklisted. So there's there's many different situations that are happening all the time, uh, but um, I can only say it, there these situations are very very much invisible. Uh, it's very very it's much harder to to find or to get you know um, uh, some kind of, of, of um, a declaration or or testimony because. Um, as they are minors, they're, they're, it's much easier to convince minors, um, not only by threatening them, but uh, making them feel that they owe uh, whomever's protecting them, and which we know it's not a necessarily a protection. It's, it's a kind of an abuse. And at the same time, uh, they're enslaving these children. But it, it is happening. But it, it's, as I said, um, and there's very little work that has been done around that. Okay, we do have a couple other questions, but for um, the sake of time, we do need to wrap it up. Um, I will leave for last words. Millie and Reed, you have about 30 seconds each uh, for sharing last words. Uh, I, I guess I can go first, Millie, if you don't mind. Um, yeah, I, I shared the link um, for the action network um, action, which is basically asking your member of Congress to co-sponsor the CARE Act. It literally takes a minute. So if, um, um, and we, I think uh, the last time I checked that we had over 300 people that had done that. Um, but, you know, cons Congress cares more about their constituents than they do about advocates like us. Um, so it doesn't take a lot of people to fill that out and ask their member of Congress before they'll decide to co-sponsor the CARE Act. So it, it is surprisingly effective. Um, so yeah, please, if you, if you can spare a minute, um, go on there and just, just ask them. It takes a, it's an automatic form and it just takes a minute and, um, you know, have, 
have help give voice to these children that, you know, most of them can't really do much to improve their situation, but, uh, you know, we're in a position to do that for them. So. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, for, for my, uh, I was trying to look if Natasha was still here. Um, uh, she has the information uh, that it can be placed also about the um, the HR eight seven six five uh, that deals with banning all um, neuro neurotoxic organophosphates um, uh, pesticides and uh, if that thank you thank you for for putting it up um, uh, if if um, if you can also try to uh, call your congressperson and, and help us with that and, um, and also support what uh, Reed is talking about in terms of all these acts that are supporting children, um, the CARE Act and um, uh, other acts that are related to in what way farm workers can get more protections, kind of like the um, Asunción Valdivia is another of the of, of uh, the legislations that Alianza is also working with. Thank you. Thank you so much for, for being here and, and hearing us. And so the way I would like to share my last words is um, just to share a story and a prayer. And this story appeared uh, on the National Farm Worker Ministries, it's tagged on our Facebook page uh, from Tomas Madrigal. I was 12. The grower convinced my parents that he was doing them a favor by taking the risk with a crew of child laborers in the 90s, but that it was worth instilling a work ethic. Under supervised in a grown person's workplace, I witnessed and experienced bullying on steroids from the older children ranging from 12 to 17. It was too much for the growers' white family members who quit within days and for the youngest brother of another white family. I didn't have the option to quit and instead learned the time work discipline that keeps me from resting to this day. Child labor fucks you up for life. It is also why I fight so fiercely for farm worker rights when the opportunity arises flipping that same time work discipline until farm worker families recover every single cent stolen from their labor. For the farm worker families who bear the exploitation of our country's agricultural system and their children who must work in the fields to help their parents survive, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. I just want to thank you all again for joining us for tonight's webinar. Um, we know this is kind of a condensed uh, or abbreviated version of child labor. So if you'd like to learn more about this topic, we encourage you to visit the National Farm Worker Ministries Harvest of Justice resources on child labor, and you can find them at nfwm.org. We will also put that uh, link within when we send out this recording to you in an email. We hope that you will connect with all of us on our various social media platforms and share our content. One of the most important ways you can help in the farm worker movement is by raising awareness. So please share our messages online with your networks. Thank you so much again for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. <clears throat> Amazing. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. Yeah, Reed and Melly, nothing's changed since we did this in